Um, so I was asked to talk about something, something having to do with it, this, this overlap of, of sleep, circadian health, and, and psychopathology. And so today I would be talking about some of the work that we're doing in terms of suicide risk. Um, so a, a few things to start out with. First of all, um, a suicide occurs in the US about every 12 minutes. The suicide rate in the US has risen by 33% in the last 20 years. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34. Uh, and it's the fourth leading cause of death, 35 to 44. Uh, it's the leading cause of death for military service members. Uh, over half of suicides show no record of known mental illness. This is the idea that everyone who commits suicide is automatically severely depressed and, and suicide is, is just a consequence of depression. Um, that's a myth. Uh, it's not. I'm not saying that, that, that um, only half have depression. More probably do, um, but it's not inexplicably tied with it. Um, and, and suicides are rising faster among women than in men. Um, a few other demographics about for every suicide, there are about 29 attempts on average. Uh, suicide rate in men is about 3.5 times that of women. Uh, but women attempt suicides 40% more often than men do. Uh, white men account for about 70% of all suicides in the US, especially middle aged white men. Uh, the next highest demographic group is American Indians. Firearms account for about half of all suicides. Uh, and about one in 167 adults has made at least one suicide attempt. Um, and I can see right now on the call, there's a little over 100 people on just on this call. So what are the most well-known suicide risk factors? Um, the most, uh, the, the biggest issue actually is serious physical health conditions, uh, including pain. Um, and then second, mental health conditions, especially depression and substance use disorders, as well as serious mental illness. Um, the issues of hopelessness, feeling trapped, being a burden to others are a big deal. So is traumatic brain injury is a major suicide risk factor. Stressful life events like divorce, rejection, financial crisis, especially acute crises where people feel like there's no way out of, of, of a future situation. Exposure to suicide increases suicide risk. Um, suicide is somewhat communicable. Um, and access to lethal means, including firearms, uh, is, is an increased risk. Sleep health is a factor in suicide. Sleep is related to all of those things we just talked about, injury, illness, and pain. I'm not going to go into all the research here linking sleep to all of these. Just take my word for it. Sleep is also related to financial hardship. Sleep is an important factor in mental illness. Sleep disturbance is a key factor in substance use. Sleep plays important roles in emotion regulation and mood. And sleep plays important roles in decision making. I'm not going into every, if I was gonna do a, a full talk on like all the links and mechanisms between linking sleep and suicide, I would be talking about how sleep links to these key suicide risk factors. But that's also not what I'm talking about today, but just so that you know this is there and this is actually really important. Um, having a major illness, especially one that's debilitating and or degenerative is a major suicide risk factor. Um, also extreme pain, whether or not in the context of illness is a major suicide risk factor. Most major medical conditions, especially those that are degenerative are associated with poor sleep and sleep loss increases pain perception, sensations of pain and impact associated with pain sensations. So again, here are some of the big picture reasons as to why um, sleep disruption is linked with suicide risk, but that's, that, that's not really what I'm focusing on. But I have to mention these because these are probably actually more important, um, or at least as important as the other stuff I'm going to be talking about. Insomnia itself is, it seems to be an independent uh, risk factor. There's a fairly recent meta-analysis. There's been a few since, but this is my favorite one. Um, that brought together studies looking at sleep disturbance um, and uh, insomnia, showing that, that insomnia was associated with about a 2.8 fold likelihood of suicide ideation, a three and a half fold likelihood of attempts, and a 2.4 fold likelihood of actual death by suicide. 
Um, here's the table from the meta-analysis. They looked at sleep disturbance of any type, insomnia, nightmares, and other sleep disturbances. Um, and what you can see here is it's not even just insomnia. It's sleep disturbances in general um, are associated with suicide risk. Is it cause or is it consequence? Um, that's, that, that, that's another question, uh, but there does, does seem to be overlapping risk. Um, just in that meta-analysis alone, I'm not going to be reviewing all the literature linking insomnia and nightmares and all these things to suicide. Um, this has been done um, a lot. Um, it should be noted that CBTI might be a promising intervention. Uh, among veterans receiving CBTI, reductions in insomnia severity were associated with reduced depression scores and reduced likelihood of suicide ideation after treatment. Other, other links between sleep and suicide risk that have come out since, one is sleep duration, uh, both short and long sleep duration associated with suicide ideation. Here's data from uh, a nationally representative sample. Uh, what you can see is this U-shaped relationship, especially at the extremes of sleep duration. Um, here's, another, uh, here's another way to look at a different nationally representative data set showing that because of this U-shaped relationship, um, what is um, the likely increased likelihood of suicide ideation as one deviates from uh, seven to eight hours of sleep, showing that the further the deviation, the greater the increased uh, likelihood that someone's also experiencing suicide ideation. Um, here's some data we looked at um, young adults. Each additional night of self-reported insufficient sleep was associated with an increased risk of um, experiencing suicide ideation. Uh, and, and even after adjustment, and even after adjusting for depressed mood, again, suicide isn't just a depression marker. Depression is part of it and a big part of it, but it's not all that that, that suicide risk is. Um, and so even after adjusting for the role of depressed mood, the more nights per week you're not feeling like you're getting enough sleep is, is associated with increased likelihood of also experiencing suicide ideation. Sleep variability has also been studied in this way, showing that uh, increased variability in sleep is associated with increased suicide ideation and worse mood over time. Nightmares, uh, I'm not gonna review the whole literature on nightmares, but this was um, one study that I especially liked, looking at frequent nightmares associated with depression, anxiety disorders, especially PTSD, and, and the presence of nightmares associated with a threefold increased risk of suicide-related uh, outcomes. And, and you can see this sort of across the board, whether it's suicidal thoughts, uh, purpose of suicide, wish to die, lack of reasons for living, and, and actual suicide actions associated with um, nightmares. Nightmare frequency differentiated multiple from single suicide attempters, even after controlling for symptoms of depression, PTSD, insomnia, nightmare severity, and stress, and nightmare chronicity. Uh, and age. And comparison participants, those not reporting suicide attempts, reported a significantly lower level of nightmare frequency than those reporting single suicide attempts. Um, so there's lots of clinical, um, clinically relevant uh, sleep issues, but also subclinical issues. So here's, we looked at um, nationally representative data uh, looking at insomnia symptoms in the population. Um, so this isn't people with insomnia. This is just people who are reporting, I sometimes have difficulty falling asleep. I sometimes have difficulty staying asleep. And what you can see is for difficulty falling asleep, you sort of see this dose response effect in terms of increased likelihood of um, having uh, insom uh, suicide ideation. With difficulty maintaining sleep, it looks um, a little more of a threshold effect. Early morning awakenings, uh, um, the relationship is, is weaker, but it's still um, people who are experiencing them often are more likely to have suicide ideation. Uh, and even like if we have an over-controlled model where we even exclude all the variability accounted for by uh, depressed mood, you still see this relationship. Um, that you still see this, this sort of dose response relationship and difficulty falling asleep and this threshold relationship of, of difficulty maintaining sleep, where if you've got difficulty maintaining sleep um, at, at sort of any level, um, you're more likely to, to be experiencing suicide ideation. And, and, I, think, and I think this is important uh, because of what, uh, of, of what I'm gonna be talking about from a sleep and circadian perspective. 
Uh, it might be that insomnia predicts suicide-related outcomes even after controlling for depression, but actually among suicidal military service members, insomnia at baseline predicted suicide ideation levels one month later, and depression scores didn't. Uh, and the direction of that association was only one way, and the same pattern was seen for suicide attempts. So actually baseline insomnia symptoms in this population, in this study, predicted um, suicide-related risk factors prospectively better than depression did, which, which you know, might account for the fact that lots of people experienced depression, but changes in, in the insomnia um, were, were more predictive. Um, other other population level risk factors. So here's um, a paper that, that recently came out from our group looking at um, non-suicidal self-injury associated with social jet lag uh, in young adults, showing that um, social jet lag was associated with recent uh, non-suicidal self-injury, um, but uh, lifetime social jet lag wasn't. Or, or life, it wasn't it was, um, social jet lag wasn't associated with lifetime non-suicidal uh, self-injury, just uh, recent and acute. Um, but in terms of, of lifetime risk, actually, um, sleep efficiency on on free days, uh, especially, was associated with um, uh, with non-suicidal self-injury lifetime. So the people who have worse weekend sleep efficiency. Uh, are more likely to have higher rates of non-suicidal self-injury. Uh, here's another paper from our group that came out recently. We were looking at um, national data sets, looking at links between prescription sleep medications and suicide risk um, and suicide ideation planning and attempts, because that's one thing that this data set had, uh, the, the NSDUH. And then we also looked at, at NHANES, which is another nationally representative data set, um, that had medications but didn't have but only had suicide ideation and what you can see is um, z drugs um, sedative benzos and trazodone are all associated with elevated likelihood of suicide related risk factors um, and I, i'm not making the case here that it's sleep medications that are causing these symptoms um, if that were the case you might see some differences along uh, mechanism of action but we don't, even trazodone. Um, and I think the point is that maybe uh, people who are being given prescription sleep medications are people who are more likely to have these symptoms and it's not fixing the problem. That would be, that would be sort of my guess. We could talk about that in questions later. Uh, here's some other work coming from our group. Again, looking at some of these potential mechanisms and, and there's the interpersonal theory of suicide um, and looking at these mechanisms. And in particular, what we were looking at is this concept of thwarted belongingness. Um, and what we found was that, that this idea of thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness, um, which are seen as, as, as major risk factors for suicide, um, they partially account for the relationship between insomnia severity and current suicide ideation, but they don't explain all of it. They don't mediate it. They partially mediate it. Um, and, and this speaks to the issue that part of the reason why insomnia might be associated with suicide risk might not necessarily be the insomnia itself. It may be um, something happening socially around insomnia, whether it has to do with the isolation uh, of being awake in the middle of the night or um, changes in thinking associated with insomnia. We can talk about the different possibilities, but there is a social element to this, um, a social interpersonal element to this. Uh, and this is another recent paper um, that, that uh, I collaborated with uh, that was led by Scott Kilgore, showing that actually trait extroversion was associated with vulnerability to sleep loss. So this is, um, following sleep deprivation, the more extroverted people were more likely to increase in um, or have higher levels of, of um, suicide ideation after sleep deprivation. Again, which speaks to this idea that, that there's something going on socially and interactively and, and, and um, in this concept of linking 
sleep and circadian mechanisms. And, and the circadians are going to, I haven't talked about the circadian much to, yet, but I'm sort of hitting at this idea that there's a, there's a nighttime thing going on um, that might be uh, interacting with, with social and emotional functioning that's increasing uh, suicide risk. And so, so why is this important? Um, I, I, to take a step back, um, why is it that, that sleep and, and circadian factors might be really important here? And um, it's really important that when we're talking about mechanisms, uh, we don't forget that sleep and circadian rhythms are not just biological processes that occur in the cell membrane in animal models. Um, when we sleep, where we sleep, and with whom we sleep are all important markers or indicators of social status, privilege, and prevailing power relations. Um, and to, 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 to quote from our, our paper in the, in the Special Issue of Science, sleep is a non-negotiable biological state required for the maintenance of human life. Sleep is foundational to our biology as a circadian rhythms. And because of that, it plays so many important roles in health. Um, and just as a quick plug, the American Heart Association redefined what cardiovascular health means just this year in 2022, this summer. They, they rebranded cardiovascular health as life's essential eight which includes um, diet, physical activity, fasting glucose, weight, uh, lipids, blood pressure, smoking, and sleep. These are the eight components um, of cardiovascular health with, with relatively equal billing. And, and not only that, I should also mention that in this paper, uh, one of the things we talked about was th this life's essential eight itself exists within the context of things like psychological health, and social determinants of health. So if you're talking about health in general, sleep is a core part of the story, which exists in context. Um, and, and, and again, I apologize for this little bit of a diversion, uh, but I think it's important to understand this context. So we always keep it in mind. So we understand A, how to interpret mechanistic data, but also how to innovate and, and make a real difference. Um, so so, so what is the context of sleep health? So you have um, sleep health associated with mental health, behavioral health, and cognitive health, all of these sort of interacting together uh, with each other, as well as cardiovascular, metabolic, and immune health. And, and, and you can imagine that all of these, you know, for the context of the current conversation, all of these are associated with, with suicide risk, whether it's you're talking about health, illness, pain. Um, you're talking about um, mental health, depression, decision-making, emotion regulation, all of these things. But what determines sleep in this context? You have uh, individual level factors. This is the, the social ecological model of sleep health that we, that we put forward a little more than 10 years ago. We've been refining sort of ever since. But the idea is that the determinants of how we sleep um, are most proximally individual. These are things like your own genetics, your, your, your own demographics, your own thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors. If you cease to exist, these things would cease to exist. These are the proximal determinants of your sleep health. But this is not where the conversation ends. These are embedded within a social level. Uh, the social level is if you cease to exist, these would still be there. These are things that, but you are a part of them. Things like where you live, where you work and your job and your occupation, your family, your culture, your social networks of various types, your socioeconomic status, and your feelings of safety where you are. All of these things, whether you're in a safe environment, all of these things are determinants of the things that are at the individual level. The individual is embedded within them. I mean, how many people can say their tiny and quality and, and duration of sleep has absolutely nothing to do with their job um, or when they're choosing to go to bed it has nothing to do with work or family obligations or where you live or any of these things. Um, the, thing, the truth is, this is an absolutely critical level to understand if we're going to understand the context. And then finally, the social level itself is embedded within a societal level. Things like 
globalization, 24-7 society, technology, public policy, racism and discrimination, um, the climate change. The fact that I am on here right now at nine something a.m. my time, and there are people at all in all different other parts of the world who are tuned into this at all their various times. We all get to talk simultaneously and learn about this. This is a societal level function uh, feature that is influencing how we interact socially. That, that, that this technology exists changes how we are interacting. And these changes in interaction are changing your and my actual decisions about when we went to bed and got up this morning. Um, for example, I woke up at a certain time to be able to be ready to give this talk here, which would have been very different if this technology didn't exist, because I probably wouldn't be giving this talk. And if I were, I would have had to fly a really long way and be jet lagged to do it. So and I'm hammering this home that, that sleep exists in context. When, when, when we had the artist draw this image, I did not draw it. When the artist drew this image, I wanted to, to really show the person sleeping in context. They're sleeping in a place. And also, um, the circadian scientists on here will appreciate the fact that I had them draw a sun in the background. And I wanted it to be ambiguous as to whether the sun was rising or setting. And so it's simultaneous, it's sort of Schrodinger's sun. It's doing both. It's both rising and setting. And it, and, and it implies that behind all of this is circadian biology, is circadian rhythms and living in a natural 24-hour world that all of this exists within. And so if we're gonna understand the mechanisms and innovate on mechanisms, we have to understand this context. But enough of that diversion, back to suicide risk. So the presence of insomnia approximately triples suicide risk. And interestingly, it's also elevated in association to other sleep disturbances like duration, timing, sleep disorder breathing, which I didn't really talk about, and nightmares. What if there's actually overlapping common mechanisms? It's not just that, lack of sleep and insomnia do different things because they don't seem to be additive. Um, they seem to, sleep problems themselves seem to predict suicide risk kind of universally, but they don't seem to be additive with each other. So what if there's sort of a common mechanism that's underlying a lot of these things? So we have an idea. Um, and so the, the originator of this idea is actually Michael Perlis. Um, and so he came up with it. So this came from the insomnia literature of why is it that um, that insomnia itself is linked to suicide? And, and clinically, what you hear a lot are people who are laying in bed, ruminating, um, thinking, you know, these these all kinds of thoughts that they have when they're alone in bed that they don't really have during the day when they're walking around. And. And so he had this hypothesis of what if part of the issue is that you're, you're, when you're laying there awake, when your body wants to be asleep, you make bad choices. You think bad thoughts. Like nobody, nobody um, has, is very clear headed at three o'clock in the morning. Like we don't make the best choices at that time. We tend to blow things out of proportion when we're laying in bed alone. There's this, this clinical observation. Like, what if there's a sort of a common mechanism here? Um, and, but how could we answer this question? And so it, it, it took us a while to find this. And it was actually Greg Brown had pointed us to the National Violent Death Reporting System. This was a, a data collection effort from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that essentially tracks violent deaths around the country coming from police reports, coroner's reports, et cetera. Um, at the time, uh, they were only they only had data from a subset of states. Now it, it's dramatically expanded, and I'll get to that. But we found this data set. Finally, we had a data set that had every suicide across a bunch of different states uh, for a bunch of different years. And a key issue is for the majority of those, they had from the coroner's reports and or police reports, time of fatal injury, not time of death, time of fatal injury. And so what we could do is we could map on um, the time of fatal injury by hour. And if this were, and, and if our hypothesis were correct, that being awake at night is bad, then you should see a rise in suicides in the middle of the night. So what we did is we plotted um, suicides by clock hour. 
Um, and this is what we found. So we, as where, where the most suicides happen at noon and the fewest amount of suicides occur at 4 p.m. or 4 a.m. Um, so, okay. So what we found was a rise in, in suicides during the day and the lowest at night. So we looked at this and we're like, oh, okay, well, there goes that hypothesis. Um, and then in the year and a half it took us to get a hold of this data set, we found a couple of studies that have done similar things. Um, all, all of these studies, they did the same thing. They plotted suicides across clock hour and found that suicides are highest in the middle of the day and lowest in the middle of the night. But then we're looking at these data and we realize we had an idea. The, there was a problem that this image that we saw of elevated suicide risk during the day and decreased at night, which is the same thing everyone saw. We looked at it like sleep people, where the other people who looked at it were looking at it like you know health services research or mental health research. We were looking at it from a sleep and circadian perspective, and we realized something. One thing that a lot of sleep people are used to is looking at signal tracing. And when you look at signal tracing, you're mentally filtering out artifacts. And what we realized was this, this image right here, this is not the suicide signal. There's a huge artifact. There's a huge signal artifact in this signal. And, and it came to the issue that our null hypothesis for looking at where the peaks are would be that hour zero equals hour one equals hour two equals hour three, et cetera. But that's not the correct null hypothesis. Why would you expect the same number of suicides to occur at 2 a.m. versus 2 p.m. When at 2 a.m., most people are unconscious, and at 2 p.m., most people are not unconscious. So if you're walking down a busy city street and there's a million people on the street with you, and a thousand of those people get pickpocketed, as opposed to at 2 in the afternoon, versus at 2 a.m., you're walking on the street and um, there's a hundred other people on the street and one of them gets pickpocketed. Well, at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m., you had a thousand events and at 2 a.m. you had one event, but actually the risk was much higher at 2 a.m., one out of a hundred versus a thousand out of a million. So, so you, had, you, had a, you had a tenfold increase in risk, even though you had a thousandfold decrease in number of events, just in, as a hypothetical example, because to commit suicide, you have to be conscious. You have to be awake for it to happen. And if most people aren't awake, so what we needed to do, we needed to find a way to filter out that wakefulness signal. And the solution came, the idea came from Matthias Basner at Penn, um, who has been looking at data through the Bureau of Labor Statistics American Time Use Survey, which has nationally representative data in, in, in 30 minute increments around the day as to whether people are sort of awake or asleep at any given hour. So what we did was we used one nationally representative data set against another to look at what is the population wakefulness signal, filter it through the suicide signal. And this is what we found. Nearly all of the increased risk was at night. This was the data that by clock hour, actually the elevated risk relative to baseline, relative to chance, was actually at night. That rise during the day was the wakefulness signal, was, was it mirrored the proportion of population awake at, the, at any given hour. So this was, this was a huge finding that, that I feel like, you know, this is the one time in my career I could say we discovered something, that there's this nocturnal signal that exists when you filter out the wakefulness signal, that, that bad things are happening in the middle of the night. Um, so we, we, we published this showing that, uh, first of all, we looked at um, whether this, this e we, we, we divided the day into six hour bins in terms of night uh, versus morning, afternoon, and evening, showing that, uh, I mean, look at these chi-squared values. Um, they're off the charts in terms of the the robustness of the signal and you can see it's it exists in men women whether you're 
across race ethnicity groups, across all age groups. It's there. It might differ across these, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it, it, it's, it's sort of this, this universal ph phenomenon that seems to exist, that being awake at night is associated with elevated suicide risk. Um, here's the data shown another way. Um, uh, so I, the, the, I have to credit this figure with, with Andrew Tubbs, uh, the grad student in our lab who, who did um, a lot of this work. Um, so there's, there's a few layers here. So first, in, in this light gray here, this is a double plotted population wakefulness signal coming from the American Time Use Survey. What proportion of the population is awake at any given hour? Um, the dark bars are the suicides that are occurring at every hour at the scaled percent. And then this line uh, with error bars is the incidence risk ratio of when you when what is the difference between what was observed versus what was expected and what you could see is during the day actually scaled you have fewer suicides than you would expect during the day but much more during the night relatively speaking um this was replicated uh by mccarthy et al in va data they used the exact same methods we did and showed the same thing in veterans. Then we ask the question, well, is there a seasonal effect? Is this a photo period thing? Because if, is it, if time of day is important, does it change across season of the year? And, and so this is what we found was that, so here you can see the signals for morning, afternoon, and evening related suicide risk, and they're, they're sort of flat. And, and this is the nighttime suicide risk relative to those bins. And what you can see here, look, it looks like nominally there's a slight uptick in like May and October. Um, they're not statistically significantly different from the other from the other months. Um, there might be something going on there, but really this is a 12 month phenomenon. Um, at no point does it doesn't sort of go away across the year and it doesn't even really vary much from month to month. Um, though there does seem to be a, a signal, but it with the error bars, it wasn't statistically significant. Well, what about method of suicide? Um, so these were the these were the um, the methods of suicide from the NVDRS data set that had enough data points that we could look at. By far, this is U.S. data, so the vast vast majority of these were um, uh, firearms related. Uh, and in terms of order of prevalence, the next common word is asphyxia, poison, etc. And what you can see is, um, so we looked at the relative likelihood of these suicides occurring at night, filtering out the wakefulness signal. And what you can see is there, there really isn't much difference. None of these were statistically significantly different from each other in terms of relative frequency at night. So it wasn't that one particular method was more likely to occur at night than others. It looks like there's some nominal differences. Um, uh, especially like vehicle, which which wasn't fall asleep crashes, um, and and fires more likely to occur at night, which might have to do with people accidentally setting things on fire. But um, it looked, but those they weren't statistically significantly better uh, or different. Um, here we replicated uh, our previous finding because our previous finding was using uh, several years of data um, on a limited number of states. What we did now is we expanded the data set to include another, I think, 10 years worth of data. And in that time, the National Violent Death Reporting System dramatically increased the number of states. So now nearly all the states reported it. And we were able to replicate the finding and show it's pretty much exactly the same, um, that, that it's, it's a really strong effect in the middle of the night. Um, so this is, this is data that, um, we, we presented at sleep last year, and this is a, a, a different representation of this paper um, will hopefully be coming out soon, showing that there, when we compared this national data, actually there might be a disparities issue uh, emerging where Hispanic and Latino adults. So this is, this is not the curve relative to the population. This is the curve relative to, to non-Hispanic or Latino Americans, where that dotted line, uh, it's the marginal incidence risk ratio um, showing that if, if they were on that line, it would be 
the same as non-Hispanic Latino. And what you can see is that this elevated risk in the middle of the night is actually higher among that group. Um, when we compared the old data set to the current one, whether it was 20, 2003 to 2010, which was from the original study, and 2011 to 2017, um, which is what we looked at more recently, what we can see is, is there's no real difference um, from one cohort to the next. Hasn't really changed. Um, then we partnered with um, colleagues at Monash to look at data from Australia. Uh, because, first of all, is, is this an American phenomenon or is this, is this a global phenomenon? And to the degree to which it's global, what about countries unlike America where everyone doesn't have guns, um, which was the most common cause of suicide? And because it's a little more immediate, you know, we, we, we knew that method of suicide probably wasn't related, but it would be good to replicate. And, and that's what we did. We showed that um, uh, fatal injuries that occurred in the middle of the night were relatively more common uh, than those during the day scaling out um, uh, wakefulness. So then we looked at, so, but these, the, the problem with those data sets are you're looking at suicides that already occurred against normative data of people that presumably mostly didn't commit suicide. So you're, 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 you're comparing not apples and oranges, but oranges and lemons. Um, and so what if the people who are committing suicide don't, don't fit into those national norms of population wakefulness? So we wanted to see, does this, does this occur within individuals? And one of the things we looked at was we found a data set. So we, we had collected data from, the, um, from, the, from our shade study looking at people's habitual sleep timing data. And we looked at their relative, their, their likely, the, the individual's likelihood that um, a, a particular hour in the day coincides with their wakefulness period versus their likelihood of also experiencing suicide ideation. So as you can see, these were the data um, th these were not depressed people. This was just a community sample. And what you could see is when you look at the, the likelihood of an individual being awake at any given hour by their self-reported habitual schedule, um, what you can see is that the people who report suicide ideation, this isn't, remember, this isn't completed suicide, it's just ideation. You can see they're more likely to be awake at night and a little less likely to be awake in the morning. Um, and when you turn this into bars, uh, in terms of relative risk, this is what you see. Um, you see this replication of the nighttime uh, effect where people who are more likely to be awake at night are also more likely to have reported suicide ideation. Uh, but what's emerging here from an ideation perspective is that actually morning wakefulness is the opposite, where people who are awake in the morning are actually less likely. And then what we did at the time, this was the only data set that, that had these, um, these data points that we knew of, but um, a couple of years later, or, or a little bit later, um, the National Health and Nutrition uh, um, uh, Evaluation Survey, NHANES, in the US had nationally representative data on self-reported um, weekday and weekend sleep times of time in and out of bed, weekday and weekend. So we can compute on an individual level whether a particular clock hour falls within their typical sleep schedule or, or typical um, daytime schedule or wakefulness schedule. And then we map that on to the likelihood that that person also experienced suicide ideation. And, and we found pretty much the same thing, that people who were reporting a wakefulness at those particular hours were more likely to report suicide ideation where people who were reporting wakefulness in the morning were less likely. Um, another thing that we found was that alcohol plays a really important role in this relationship, that um, especially in young adults, that there is a, a statistically significant um, alcohol by time interaction, especially in, in, in ages 15 to 34. Remember, this is the age group where suicide is the second leading cause of death, um, and also in older adults. Um, uh, but especially in the younger age group, what you can see is that if you have um, significant alcohol in your system at the time of death, this is back to the time of death data, um, 
you're more likely, the, the, the risk at night is even higher. Um, in terms of demographics, you can see there are, this was data we presented at Sleep last year, uh, and, and we're, we're working on getting the paper out now, um, that you can see there, there are differences by age, um, sex, race, ethnicity. I showed you the Hispanic versus non-Hispanic data, um, marital status and military status. They, they are different across groups. Um, and, we're, and we're trying to model that. It exists in all of them, but they might be different in different groups. Um, but then is this just about suicide? So, so actually we think that this is a transdiagnostic, transdisciplinary issue of nocturnal wakefulness. Uh, if nocturnal wakefulness, it's not necessarily suicide specific, it leads to all kinds of things. Uh, one example being violent crime. Um, so you can see when, when homicides occur um, and, and violent assaults, they, they do seem to occur at night. Uh, and so when we looked at um, data from the National Institute of Justice, um, that from the Department of Justice and the federal government, looking at the timing of violent crimes, and then when we mapped that onto the American Time Use Survey data for the age groups involved, we found that for adults, and especially juvenile violent, uh, perpetrated violent crimes. So these are the perpetrators of violent crimes. Those crimes are committed, um, more likely to be committed during the night with that same sort of peak at, at two to three in the morning or one to three in the morning. Um, but the, the peak is higher for juvenile violent crime. Um, then since then, uh, we've looked at homicide data. So these are the victims. This is from the National Violent Death Reporting System, the same one that we looked at the suicide. So when we switch suicide out for homicide, notice the 24 hour pattern of homicides very different than suicide. You don't see as strong of a wakefulness signal. When, you met, when we mapped on um, the wakefulness signal, you can see that it doesn't map on the same way that suicides do. Suicides have a very strong wakefulness driven signal where homicides, have uh, a time of day issue where they tend to peak um, a little before midnight. But if we if we filter out the wakeful, even if we filter out the wakefulness signal, we show that you know you have homicides much more likely um, to occur during the night than they would, uh, as you would expect, um, based on wakefulness. Um, again, here you have uh, a significant um, alcohol risk. So, for example. People who don't have any alcohol in their system, these are, these are uh, people who are victims of homicide, not perpetrators, these are victims. Um, this is the nocturnal elevated risk of victims of homicide with no alcohol uh, versus some alcohol, but below the legal driving limit um, versus people who are legally drunk or, or legally impaired, intoxicated. And what you can see is you have a much higher likelihood of being a victim of homicide if you are awake during the night and have alcohol on board. Um, so we've got a couple of studies going on that are exploring some of these mechanisms. Um, in particular, we have the ANSWER study, um, which stands for addressing nocturnal sleep-wake uh, effects on risk for suicide, that we're looking at, at some of these mechanisms in terms of if we can change um, what they're doing in the middle of the night and looking at some of the brain activity during the night. And then we have the in-bed study, which is investigating neurocognitive behaviors after dark, um, where we're looking at other health-related choices across the day. Um, other, other things that happen in the middle of the night, um, nobody craves a salad at two o'clock in the morning either. Uh, and we think that these are all common mechanisms. So our hypothesis is, um, we've sort of dubbed it the, the mind after midnight. I have to give credit to Andrew Tubbs for that name. Um, and so the idea, it represents how we think this nocturnal wakefulness is associated with risk. Um, so we think that there's that there's decreased act, changes to, to a, a wide range of brain areas, including the amygdala, nucleus accumbens, the insula, um, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, rostral anterior cingulate cortex, and prefrontal cortex, and that together um, you have activation in some of the emotion centers and you have decreased activation in some of the centers that are sort of making good decisions. And so what you have is an elevation in risky types of behaviors where you're, where you're 
um, meeting these emotional needs, but not doing it in a good way. So they're out of they're they're out of balance and, and out out of control. Um, this is where the catastrophization comes in and the hopelessness and some of these some of these drivers without the regular inhibitors. So this is where you might have more violent substance use and dysregulated food intake during the night, which could then could lead to these negative um, this negative feedback. But at the same time, because your emotion centers and, and thinking centers are, are, are impaired during the night, that this feedback doesn't get processed properly. And so this is sort of the, this is the version that's in the paper. Um, this is the a link. This is a, um, this is the paper uh, that, that where we spelled this whole thing out that um, in addition to this process, you have nocturnal wakefulness, which is driven by uh, whether it's insomnia, insufficient st sleep, stresses, you have all these different, you have these different mechanistic pathways involved, which lead to the behavioral dysregulation and the actual being awake when your body wants to be asleep. And at the same time, you have the circadian nighttime processes that are promoting sleep, but also leading to these vulnerabilities. And then the combination of those two things creates what we're calling sort of the mind after midnight. Um, so where are we going from here? We're really trying to explore these mechanisms underlying this relationship. That's that's really what we're trying to do next. Um, and, and understand how this can help us prevent suicide at a population level and how this can help us better treat conditions that are at high risk for suicide. Um, and so here's another um, editorial that where we talk about this, um, using the potential for, for sleep and circadian health for suicide prevention. Um, and a quick plug uh, for to Teresa Aurora, who really led this effort and doing a meta-analysis of psychological resilience. And, and I wanna end here because uh, I wanna end on this positive note that lack of sleep and being awake when you're not supposed to be, might be associated with bad stuff, but getting good sleep, better quality and sleeping a little more might be associated with good stuff. Um, and so this meta-analysis, again, uh, she led this, she's amazing um, and, and really showed that you had sleep duration associated with better psychological resilience. And a lot of studies in this meta-analysis showing that sleep quality associated with psychological resilience, even prospectively, that prospective changes to, to, to sleep quality can improve emotional resilience. Um, I wanna thank um, uh, the, the main collaborators on this work. You have Michael Perlis, who, who, who is the originator of this idea. And so we worked together with, on this when, when I was at Penn, and then we just sort of keep working on this ever since. Uh, next is Andrew Tubbs, who is um, an MD-PhD student in our lab, who, who led a lot of this work, and, and this is the focus of his dissertation. Uh, Fabian Fernandez, who is a researcher also here at the University of Arizona, as, as a circadian person, um, and, and who's been a primary collaborator on this work. Uh, Bobby Chakravorty at, at Penn, who is sort of the, who, who led a lot of the substance use uh, angles to this work, uh, and Jordan Karp, a uh, psychiatrist and, and, and our chair here in psychiatry, who has a background in um, suicide prevention and, and community mental health. So um, thanks a lot, and, and hopefully we've got some time for questions. And feel free to contact me at any point, I'm, I'm pretty open. <laughs>